And today we will be talking about the role of nature in the projects that we develop in order to first decenter the human, promote circularity and be able to pass through these new ways of thinking through communication and education. Um, what we're talking about here today is not only how to be more sustainable in our projects, but actually challenge the way we're doing our projects in order to promote a working and societal culture that is more inclusive with nature. That is why today we will be discussing how to embrace nature as a co-designer, as a collaborative partner for a circular future. For that, uh, we've invited a very interesting panel of people, all working in projects related uh, to nature, the environment and sustainability. Um, the panel will be structured in three parts with a final space for Q&A. Um, we will be discussing these three topics. First, we will kick off with life-centered design and how we can embrace design for the planet, humans and nature as a methodology in our work. Um, we will be hearing here from Digby Asher and Jeroen Spolstra, who have both explored how to shift from a human-centered mindset to a more than human one. Um, we will also talk about fostering a culture of sustainability and how can we support communities and individuals to have more sustainable cultures. Um, here we will hear from Patricia Carbonet, who has experience in the communication of sustainability related projects and with Dr. Rachel Clark, who can share with us how to foster these cultures through education. And finally, we will be talking about designing for circularity and how can we design systems that are more nature-centric and develop environmental sustainability in the private sector. Um, here, here we will be hearing from John Belitz and Roberto Battistoni, who both have experience working for the private sector in sustainability and circularity projects. It is great um, to have such a diverse uh, panel and I will be providing a little bit more detail into each of one of our panelists and their practice once they, they get to present in the three sections that we've prepared. Um, before starting, I will also like to take the chance to introduce the team from MA Service Design who have made this panel possible. Sophia and Anirudh, who couldn't be here today but have been key to the previous planning of the panel. Tahat and Aya, who today will be our technical support. Ipek, who will be in charge of moderating the Q&A, and myself, who will be facilitating this panel. Also, before starting, just some reminders. Um, the Q&A will happen at the end of the panel, although we will start having a lot of presentations before that. But we do encourage all of participants to engage. Meanwhile, we have a Q&A section. Uh, to, you can start asking your questions along the way or even share your reflections on the go. Uh, we would love to hear from you during the whole of the event. Um, for the Q&A, we will be collecting questions and directing them to the panelists at the end of the session, as I mentioned. Also, we would appreciate if you can disable your mic uh, from all the attendees. If not, we will take care of that as well. Um, also, the event is being recorded for those that could not attend and also recording uh, for future MA services and generations. And finally, uh, be, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any follow up question after the panel, you want to share anything or reach out to the panelists and don't know how. Um, and yet before starting uh, the different sections I mentioned before where our panelists will be delving into the topics of this panel, we would like to kickstart by asking you all a question. In a sentence or a couple of sentences, what does nature as a co-designer mean to you and the work that you do? So please, everyone that has joined us today here and wants to share their own definitions, we would love to hear it, so don't hesitate to share in the chat. But meanwhile, we wanted to get the chance to for our panelists to share in one sentence their, def their own definitions first before we kick start for, with everything. So quickly, if we could go around and answer this question among the panelists, I wanted to ask who would like to, to kick off with their own definition. Maybe you, I can start if you want. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is, or the way that I look at it is, um, in nature, or considering that we have this one planet, there are clear limits. Right? I think the recognition of limits in the way that we live our lives and we design products, service, and systems around that have to recognize that there are location-bound, but also global limits to uh, resources and materials, biomass, and so on, that we can 
use. And um, I think it's wonderful that uh, in this panel we bring people together that from a service point of view take into account how do we take the limited stock of resources, energy, and so on, and fulfill that or create mechanisms, institutions, or whatever, whatever level you want to look at it to fulfill human needs, right? And doing that in a way that we can sustain that. So I think limits is kind of the, the key word that, that comes to mind. Amazing. Thank you, Jonah. I mean, anyone who would want to follow, I didn't plan a, a specific order, but just jump in. Yeah. Um, I can go next. <clears throat> <clears throat> so from my side, I think it's about the story since I'm a communicator, no? the more closer I get to nature, observing it, understanding the patterns, uh, the more inspired I get. Uh, and this allows me to add depth and relevance to the stories uh, that we create. Uh, more constructive and make us feel part of nature, not separated from it. So it kind of fosters emotions, a sense of responsibility, and that's how I work no, together with, with nature in the process of designer communication strategies and campaigns. Amazing. Thank you, Patricia. I can follow up on that. Um, I live in nature. I live kind of surrounded by it. So for me, it's kind of more, you know, it starts with living with nature almost. You know, we had this massive thunderstorm last night, kind of with I don't know how much wind and kind of like you're kind of in the middle well, in the house, but in the middle of it. So it's kind of more like really realizing and feeling that you're in nature and with nature. And that's kind of a starting point to kind of for me to design with. Thank you, Yero. I'm happy to sort of go next if um, I've sort of following on from that sort of both communication and living aspect, I think the whole is sort of, for me as a bio designer and interaction designer, there's a sort of critical discord of engagement with living systems and the sort of assemblages, also both species and sort of um, ecosystem in that sense. And being able to sort of almost um, rethink probes that can actually sort of have a dialogue um, with nature and ecosystems in that way. Amazing, thank you. Um, if I can respond to that as well, I think um, from so working with students and also practitioners about ways, um, I think it's an opportunity to question what design is and what our role as humans are is are in the within as as designers um, and what design actually means for you know do does nature design or does it just get on with uh, what it's doing? Um, so I think it, like philosophically and methodologically, I think it really, for me, it helps us think, really question what design is, but also question what uh, our relationship with uh, nature and those kind of distinctions that we, we sort of stick to. And then what we, what we do then as designers um, practically. Definitely. Well, th thank you, everybody. Roberto here. I'll uh, I'll try to go next. Um, from my point of view, I think my point of view is um, quite pragmatic in terms of um, you know the design and, and and the relationship with nature. So to me, it's about the life cycle and the life cycle assessment. So having in mind when you design a product, the um, impact that that product will have throughout its life. So thinking about the production, thinking about the transportation and thinking about the usage of uh, that product. For example, thinking about, um, you know, ma making sure that it uses um, less water than average or that it has um, less uh, impact on deforestation or on uh, uh, river pollution and so on and so forth. Definitely. Thank you, Roberto. It's important to think how our projects also relate to nature, right? Not just as designers or communicators or, or teachers. I wanted to share a couple of other sentences that came into the chat. Thanks for sharing. Um, from Elliot, we have here embracing the system aspect of nature, staying open and critical as we keep learning every day more about nature. And Damien also shared recognizing and acknowledging what relationships exist between the people making design decisions and nature, quite in line with what you guys were saying, um, Rachel, our relationship with nature. Um, from all that you were saying, I, I can see a lot of 
how we communicate with nature, about nature, how we open that those dialogues with our projects. And I would, I'm, I'm really pleased to now uh, give uh, space for, for these different presentations we will hear from all the panelists to actually share how they do that for their projects. Um, so uh, without further ado, we will start with our first section of this panel, um, which is life-centered design and how we can embrace design for the planet, humans and nature as a methodology in our work, hearing from Digby Asher, our first panelist. Uh, who is Associate Lecturer of Service Design and Interaction Design at University of the Arts London. Um, Digby is a bio designer, as he mentioned, and researcher working on design-led civic and biosocial engagement. And as a lecturer, he has experience in community co-design within local councils such as Camden and Southwark Council in London. And he also embraces a focus to understand and co-create with multi-species encounters. And um, Digby has prepared some slides today, so will, will you be sharing your slides or do you prefer us to do so? Um, wh whichever, uh, if you've got them up, that, that works just as well. Okay. Just to um, say, yeah. <laughs> Aya is our technical support today, so she will be sharing your slides. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Digby. I'm a, well, as you heard, bio designer and researcher. Um, and associate lecturer and like I said earlier for me sort of nature as a co-designer is um, is sort of having that that engagement with living systems um, I'm going to talk about a sort of tiny bit of what I do and how that links to um, sort of projects and specifically how it can, how these um, how we can generate ideas uh, biological contexts materials and I mentioned assemblages and um, how they can be integrated within communities Go to the next slide, please, Aya, if possible. Um, so, sort of this this aspect of design for sort of social innovation, um, sort of specifically focuses on facilitating workshops and projects that connects residents and communities into the sort of complex interlinked challenges of um, so social justice, ecology, and um, the climate crisis. And the one on the left that you can see um, with Salat Council, the Climate Studio. Um, offers a means to rethink um, local or offered a means to rethink local council policy and it was specifically sort of through the facilitation of um, design-led civic engagement activities and within this it was it was as lots of you know from service design and hearing about it from both myself Lara and Marion um, we were sort of focusing on co-creating futures, futures and using making as a medium to physically represent the touch points of these services. On the right, there's a project with sort of future neighbourhoods and sort of greening neighbourhoods um, with Camden Council and the Mayor of London and the Public Collaboration Lab. And this was um, through sort of rethinking a sort of seed library service. And with the increasing effects of sort of climate change, um, actually, rather than solely having a seed library, and how can you apply have categories of books in a library, could you actually categorise seeds by plant functions, whether that's health and well-being around air purification, medicinal qualities um, around sort of the urban landscape and infrastructure, climate cooling, flood control. Um, how can you how can this be a service and sort of medium to translate the significance and meaning of plants, which is already sort of um, sort of having a dialogue with existing traditional and ecological knowledge and that's already being used by indigenous communities. Um, so just to give an example, um, actually, if your if you're sort of area is ex or street is experience, about to experience flooding or will is predicted to experience flooding, um, councils no longer have huge budgets to implement flood defences. Could you go along to your seed, um, seed library and climate proof your area? And it's and again, both projects sort of around sort of empowering direct infrastructure and activism. And again, building climate resilient neighbourhoods in a way of, in, as a sort of means of um, empowerment. If you go to the next slide. Hiya. Um, with, sorry, one sec. I, <laughs> sorry, the sofa's outside the office being moved. Um, <laughs> um, so, with this project um, in sort of parallel to this as a biodesigner, um, I'm uh, this project sort of aimed to understand and sort of co-create with that the sort of multi-species encounters that I was sort of mentioned earlier. 
and um, Milk's quite remarkable um, because it offers, as a specialist sort of service designer, offers a unique medium to explore the sort of um, role of hybrid and hybrid human non-human relations. And um, to give a bit of context, the project was um, it it was sort of exploring waste milk specifically in India, the largest dairy industry in the world, um, to actually um, sort of could this create a bone-like material for sort of prosthetics um, for unserved amputees, which has also has the highest proportion of unserved amputees. Um, and it was built from a, upon a sort of localized context and um, and sort of from a service perspective, um, it was quite it's quite niche in the sense of it um, there's, it sort of spans across the transdisciplinary landscape and milk as a medium does that too. Um, and within that, you're sort of we're touching on sort of healthcare, environmental issues, complex sort of biological processes, supply production changes, and as lots of you already know, going into your final major projects and those that sort of there's there's a there's a temporal and sort of spatial uh, modality to them where it's subject to material change and transformation and decay. And I suppose this project sort of again started a sort of conversation between health and the Earth's living and non living ecosystems. Sorry, if we could go to the next slide. Thanks. And exploring sort of prosthetic pathways and sort of milk waste and these expired systems, it the project itself sort of displayed the sort of complexities and different levels of both the microscopic and the global. And I think services service design allows you to explore this sort of important field that we're moving towards. It's more of a sort of coordinated systems based and policy forming action. And this is an example of sort of the global scale of actually uh, mapping prosthetic pathways down from national, well, sort of global, national, and actually how they get to um, um, sort of um, rural healthcare centres. And then this, sorry, if we move to the next slide, that would be. And sort of applying this, um, this, this approach around sort of the microscopic and the global. Um, there's quite, there was a sort of large um, focus on the sort of political ecology of milk. And political ecology sort of having that allows an analysis of interconnected issues um, with both local and global dynamics and the outcomes that are sort of entrenched in, in social inequality and ecological um, degradation. And um, there's within this, you've got sort of this new emerging field of microbiopolitics. Um, we've all heard of sort of Foucault's biopolitics, but actually we often, um, this sort of concerns the recognition, sort of management of sort of government as a sort of governing counters with the microscopic, but biopolitics is often res restricted to sort of visible ecologies. And this notion of um, actually how can we reconsider invisible non-human roles? And within milk, I found this such sort of a sort of um, sorry to go on this sort of like mastermind um, specialist topic. Uh, and this is it's we sort of it's it's this medium to explore these notions. And we've always considered um, whether that's zoonotic diseases and healthcare. We've sort of got this binary notion of good bacteria versus bad bacteria in this sense. And I suppose what I'm trying to say within with this um, to sort of sum up is that without service design, this would just be material exploration. And um, with, without a sort of that, that zooming in and zooming out, there's it would be sort of limited thought to the sort of systemic landscape around that. And I've been talking about this in sort of a slightly speedy meta level. Um, but what I'm trying to sort of demonstrate is actually this zooming and zooming out of the molecular, the human level, the healthcare level, farming accidents, and at an ecological scale, um, it's, I suppose, nature as a co-designer, it's not enough to just be human centred. When working with the environment, there are all these sort of different levels. And um, I suppose, similar to what, similar to what Rachel um, was saying at the start, this, this way of working helps us sort of reconsider what it is as, um, what consider our role as a designer in that way. And that's a sort of speedy run through. Amazing, thank you, Digby. I, I found particularly interesting how you talk about, you know, how you use service design tools. On the one hand, in service design, we always talk about co-creation, but how can we co-create co -create beyond uh, humans and with other species as well? 
and yeah. also as well how to consider the whole system, right? So many times behind environmental issues, there is a social one. So and being able to map human and more than human stakeholders is essential to kind of carry out these sort of projects um, in a more systemic way. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. Cool. Thank you. So up next in this section uh, will be Jeroen Spostra. Uh, Jeroen is one of the leading figures in life-centered design, and he runs three enterprises, and Beaton Studio, the life-centered design school, and a mountain bike um, guiding company. After nearly 20 years of design experience, Jeroen shifted to life-centered design, inspired by his move to the Spanish Pyrenees. He will tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, in the presentation, and Jaren shift um, um, and be witnessing climate change firsthand when he moved to the Spanish Pyrenees, and how this affects nature and the local communities. And now he helps creative professionals transition to this life-centered design. Uh, so Jaren, the the floor is yours. I think you'll be presenting yourself, right? Yeah. Thank you for your introduction, Anna, and thank you for your beautiful presentation, Digby. I really like this like seed bank thing where you go to you can like oh I have to kind of like protect my neighborhood for flooding what kind of seeds that's very really, really great I love this kind of like thinking um how do I share my sound so I think if you share it will it will work right Aya if you yes. share and I think it works directly okay Okay, um, a little bit kind of like um, to what uh, Rachel said, we have to kind of rethink our the way we design. Uh, and one thing that I kind of came came about when I when I, I started designing more outside, so I have like design sessions outside with with my partner or with colleagues. Is like uh, when you're outside, you're slowing down, you're taking more. You're having more eye for like the details and for things around you then you're going in a fast design sprint so from that's why we have less design sprints and more design walks to kind of like slow down the pace of designing and be more open um this is where i live um in a tiny this is a tiny village in the spanish pyrenees and just um for to realize kind of how close I live to nature, it's like on the back side you see this mountain, and we're going to listen to a beautiful mountain lake in in a second. But on the front side uh, of my house, which is on the bottom of the village, this week there was a dead sheep in the field. Um, so the morning I woke up with a fox uh, feeding itself uh, from uh, from the sheep. He left the field, and after three to four hours, there were hundred vultures in my in the field bef before me. And now there's just bones. And this is kind of this. Um, uh, we're, I'm live next, I live in this kind of transition phase zone between nature and humanity. So we're actually kind of in the middle of it, but like, um, and I realized this week, like, how would it be if you have hundred vultures in the middle of like, I don't know, like a, a square in Amsterdam or in, in Barcelona or in London, how would that feel? We have pigeons there, but how would it feel if you have vultures there? How, how close can we allow nature to come into, to our lives? Um, so the best way to kind of explain maybe to what life design is, is by listening to a glacial lake. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it now. I will explain a little bit more about after the lake has talked to us. Um, so sit back and relax. Do you hear it? No, we're not hearing okay. it. Okay. But yeah, we tried before with your presentation, so maybe we can share and, and try that way. Huh? Shall we try again? Yeah, I was thinking because we tried as a team before we did a run through, so maybe Aya, yeah, you can share the screen uh, because it was working before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One second. Do you see it now? Mm. Yeah, I don't hear it well. Um, maybe I have the, the mic. 
Khan. Can you go one back? The second, the third slide. The previous slide. Yeah. Hello there. Yes. I'm Igor Plan, also known as Pasta de la Mora. Welcome. I am a glacial lake, which means I've been here since prehistorical times. If I tell you the pine cones are actually flowers that resemble their cone bearing ancestors, you'll understand that I've been here for a long time. The 430 kilometer long mountain chain of the Pyrenees you can see around me was formed 65 million years ago by the collision of the tiny Iberian and the Eurasian plate. I am of service. My surface reflects the sky, the mountains and the trees around. I'm never alone. I have a significant role here. I host an entire ecosystem, from the microorganisms and frogs that live in my waters to the cattle and animals that come to drink me. My rocks protect the lizards that live under and the moss that resides on top. My trees need to be solid and resistant to hold the soil. So you see, we protect each other. It's a very delicate balance to maintain. I'm the first cop pine you see when you arrive here. I heard you coming on my pebbles because I'm so exposed. Nobody dares to be against my bark. These are my kids. They grow under my wings. Here, my friends live and die. And when they do, you could say I reuse their bodies. And I produce a lot of mud. Most humans don't really like it especially girls. We are a community. And to be healthy, the balance of all forms of life living within me must be too. Just as bacteria in your gut manage your digestion, the planktons and other microorganisms living within me enable the cycles of nature. Nowadays, I'm even part of Instagram pictures. Sometimes I feel like humans only see me as expendable, an add-on to the place that doesn't move, live, or breathe. But I do. My lungs are the mountains from which I draw the snow that composes my mass. My legs are all the path I take to arrive at the delta of the Ebro. I have a direction indeed, and a reason to exist. I am not an accessory, and I'm actually the reason why you are coming. Look at me. Sometimes I would like you to see me. Can't you see the ripples and waves I form? How perfect are they? Isn't it relaxing to look at me? My waves are like a massage to the little creatures inside me. Can't you see? I create peace around me. Rivers carry granite rocks and pebbles tickle me. We meet every day and love together. Look at me, I'm laughing, can't you hear? Connect with me. I am a natural obstacle that forces you to slow down and go around me. You cannot not see me. You have to stop and choose which way to go and which path to follow. Will you go left or will you go right? When you come with your electric mountain bike, you drive so fast you don't see me. When you leave your trash and swim inside my waters, you're poisoning me with your human creams and sunscreens, leaving a chemical print that will take decades to disappear. If I had a voice, I would ask you, little human, to protect me. My nature needs time to regenerate. I feel so weak already. The views and peace you enjoy are a privilege I'm glad to bless you with. But please, not all at the same time. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so a little bit of context uh, on on uh, on this non-human persona, on the story of this lake. So the idea was to kind of like um, do a life and time project in the region uh, concerning tourism. And this lake is very popular by tourists because it's easy accessible, takes 45 minutes by car on a, it's not a paved road, but it's a very well maintained road. 
um, and it's a beautiful example of kind of like how we, how we as tourists impact um, uh, nature. You know, we, we go all together at one spot. Um, so together with a group of students and other designers, we kind of went to this lake to really dive into kind of like, uh, dive, well, not in, swim in the lake, but dive into its surroundings, immerse itself, and we combined that with um, research we found on the climate impact on the Pyrenees itself, uh, on tourism, kind of how, how it was spread. Um, and the funny thing is, is that both like on, on different levels, there was already impact by just doing this. So kind of going there with the team of students and designers and immersing ourselves in silence. So literally we went um, individually kind of went to a place where to sit down, to connect either with the water, with the trees, with the, with the surrounding mountains, that people came back as a way more relaxed in a different in a different manner. Uh, so that was one impact just on being the, on the designer itself. But on the other side, what, what we learned was like, we had this idea that we want to explore the impact of local tourism on this lake. But actually, if you dive to, into kind of the, the biology, geology, and kind of the climate change, this lake is not just talking to the locals, it's talking to, to a global world, because the impact of climate change global climate change is you is felt in this little spot. So that's for one. The other thing, this is like one lake which is connected to kind of a big uh, delta in Spain that runs from the west to the east side to the Mediterranean. So it's part of this really bigger ecosystem. Um, and a little bit the same what Dick said, like from like microscopical level to kind of like systemic level, it's all connected. So if you want to design solutions or pathways for solutions you don't have not you can you can look into the local level where you say um, hey how can we spread maybe the pressure on this lake kind of like by kind of uh, allowing less people to go up um, those kind of things but also kind of can you talk with outdoor brands to kind of like educate their people the people that buy their stuff more you know or like Spanish are really good in designing very bright outdoor clothing maybe they can do it a little bit less bright or you can talk to the brands of e-mountain bikes from don't go biking along this lake, but get off your bike and walk past it so that you can really enjoy it and can like learn something from it. But then there's also this kind of more systemic level where you go into industries or banking. Or when you go, for example, to booking.com or Airbnb, why can't, you know, next to the, uh, this hotel is full. Maybe that can also be like a button where you can say, like booking to come or everybody said like, oh, we'd rather advise you not to go to this area because uh, nature is full. It's too busy here in this season. It's not good for nature. I suggest you to go maybe more to a city or to another place, you know? And also you could do that kind of in terms of weather. Um, that's kind of, that, you know, it's not, it's, it's a tiny lake. It's really small, but it talks to the whole world. And hence also you can kind of define several challenges uh, and design for those. Next slide. Yeah, so, uh, and another way to look at it is that um, the things that we design have an impact on the planet, on society, and on economy, and also kind of like um, with what we focus on um, mainly when we design products is for the economy. There's a, when there's a need for it, there's a, there's a, the, we discover a need for an end user and we're going to design for that and then we're going to earn money from that end user. So that's kind of how it simply, simply put. <laughs> um, but by doing that, we're taking out all the resources of the planet. We're forgetting a lot of people in society that are not involved in the design process. Um, and with life and design, we should kind of like really look deeper into the impact and the attention of our designing. Last or next slide. So to me, what is life and design? It's an actionable design approach that gives designers and other creatives the mindsets and opportunities and ability to design more holistically. Um, it allows designers to include all life forms and advocate for those biological ecosystems and non-user communities. Uh, and we have to move away from creating value for just the end user and shareholders towards adding value for nature, communities, and the economy. Next slide. 
So I don't really have much time to kind of explain this all, but if you want to know more, uh, next Wednesday we're running a webinar. Uh, and there we go in for of an hour, and there we go into a deeper explanation of all the things we do around lifestyle design. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can share the yeah. link here. Yeah, you can share in the chat. I already signed up for, for the session. Looking forward. Great. Um, and thank you for your presentation. I love yeah. how you talk about, you know, like finding harmony with nature and also like building empathy. And I love the non-human persona because personas is a tool that we use as, mm -hmm. as designers often to build empathy. But how can we build empathy with others that don't have a voice in the language that we have, but speak yeah. differently, right? So how can we translate that into, mm -hmm. into a human voice for everyone to understand? And yeah, I loved it because often we talk about this entering the human in our projects, but it's kind of hard to give the voice to these other actors and you kind of accomplish that with with your persona. Oh, we're, so and we're you. in the start. There's so many things to kind of go by, I think, for like including new nature. And this is just one, one thing, uh, which is really helpful, I think. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Now we will move on to the next section. Before that, just reminding uh, to people you can ask any question in the chat that you would like to the panelists and, and of course they can answer now or like we can wait for the end of the panel to redirect all these questions and yeah well now we will be entering our second section of this panel um, which is fostering a culture of sustainability and how can we support communities and individuals to have more sustainable cultures we will first hear from Patricia Carbonell uh, she is head of Revolve uh, Barcelona office. Uh, Patricia is an experienced communicator and creative thinker. And as head of the Barcelona office at Revolve, she leads a creative team and manages communications of EU funded research and innovation projects related to agroecology, soil health and adaptation to climate change. For the past six years, she has been also building a community of journalists and media professionals to raise awareness about the value of water and engaging with non-technical audiences around Mediterranean regions. Patricia has prepared some slides to showcase one of the projects at Revolve, where they've engaged communities through communication and education. Uh, and I think, Aya, you will be sharing the slides for, for Patricia. Thank you, Ada. Hello, everyone. Um, today I want to talk about soil. As our co-designer, um, I wanted to bring one of the most important topics that we've been uh, exploring, understanding, creating empathy over the past years. Because in Revolve, we play a role at the intersection of the science. We work with scientists trying to understand the evidence, the data and the media and the wider public, which is non-technical audiences normally. So we have a sometimes a challenge no? to really to really transmit this and, and make it accessible somehow. So soil is the center of one of these EU funded projects that we are working on at Revolve and it's called NB Soil, as you can see here in the slide. It started in December 2022 and it will last until 2026. So we have these five years to test and create learning pathways for existing and new soil advisors. So we are creating jobs or reinforcings that are to actually are working on, on, on the protection, restoration of the soil and the land. And why we think that soil is our co-designer? Because without it, it will be impossible to think about it. Uh, it's mainly because soil is the foundation of our food systems. So it provides the, the food that we eat. And it's, it's hard to, to imagine you know, that 95% of the land will turn into desert by 2050. And so we are facing a soil extinction, yet 95% of our food comes from the soil. So we really put it at the center. And, and it's a double sword because soil, it's the largest carbon sink uh, when it's rich and healthy, but degraded soil uh, can turn into the largest carbon emitter and accelerate worldwide warming. So it really depends on how we collaborate and care for each other. No, that's why we feel that it's our co-designer because otherwise there's no solutions not to really continue with our with our lives. So we feel that it needs fixing and we are trying to really find the ways, more creative ways, but obviously bringing the data at the forefront um, to really get the message across. Let's go to the next one. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here, how, how we have a split a little bit, no? Like the, the mission that we have is to really communicate about the soil health, no? Which is a concept that we need to break down into the benefits of what it provides. And as you can see here, so we we, we need a healthy soil to ensure well-managed grazing, to have good quality of water, to get habitats for biodiversity while contributing to climate resilience, um, forage quality to avoid soil erosion and degradation. So, and overall, we need it for our own cultural heritage and, and to protect the landscapes, which are the, which are the basis of our economy. And basically, we are on a mission to reverse this trend, to working together with conservation and organizations, with experts working on the on the topic, and we provide our input in the ways uh, that we could frame, no, the, with tools, different tools that I will explain later, how we can bring these, you know, benefits into the to the mainstream uh, scenarios. Let's go to the to the next one. And yes, the core of this uh, project, it's mainstreaming nature-based solutions. With nature-based solutions, we, we um, uh, address basically actions that aim to protect, uh, sustainably manage or restore uh, the soil. And for us, it's, it's, it's very important no? because sometimes it feels like a uh, as uh, so important that it is, it usually tends a, like a backstage seat in the policy sphere. So our role is to really influence those policies. It's also to sort of persuade as well some changes in, in different audiences. So it has, it's basically a role of raising awareness, but also engaging about the importance. Empathy, as we were seeing with the, the previous example, which was beautiful. No, that's the kind of storytelling that we need to get across uh, as, the, as we highlight the benefits, basically, no? Um, so basically, we produce different contexts uh, that is available on our website and in a printed magazine that put this, this at forefront uh, in, in different media. We try to use con constructive narratives, focusing on the solutions, no, and putting nature at the core, and connecting the dots uh, between the different signals that we are seeing. So it's not talking only about the environment or the nature per se, but also connecting the dots between the economical scenarios, political, social, tech, and of course, always with an environmental eye, let's say, no? uh, which is the nature at the at the center. So um, yeah, this, this partnership is allowing us to, to, to foster more real narratives because we are working on the ground with these uh, farmers, with soil advisors, with people that want to be a part of the, the, the scene in the, in the next years. And so it's a, a big role. Uh, let's go to the to the next slide. And here's one of the examples of the uh, tools that we are building. Basically, we are bringing like a sort of uh, digital tool and application that brings uh, a portfolio of nature-based solutions with attractive visuals, with creative narratives, with real examples, with best practices of nature-based solutions for soil and their benefits for society. So um, we are trying to visualize this, uh, breaking this down, soil health, which is a big topic, no, a big terminology, into some practical examples. Here, the ones that we are using are organic fertilizers for locally available bio waste. So allowing these circular methodologies to, to rise and putting examples of, of it. Co cover crops, which is one of the, the, the most important as well to avoid soil erosion and many other benefits. Forest diversification uh, and also blue and green infrastructure in urban and peri-urban areas on different uh, landscapes, which is very important as well to differentiate the landscape and, and create a more holistic understanding on the, of the contexts. And other a bit more technical, such as polyculture and bioremediation, as you can see here, but also to start the conversation about how important these practices are, no? how the benefits again, no? uh, through different uh, tools. So this is one of the examples, and we can go into the next one. Um, we are also um, uh, well working on one of the biggest outcomes of this project, which is a soil academy. Uh, it's a, uh, the plan is to launch a two-year training program that will provide a, an interactive experience. It will be flexible and it will be open uh, for participants, both online and in field visits, to explore about the benefits of soil. Uh, we will start with an introductory um, MOOC, a massive, massive op open online course, and with four advanced modules uh, with the topic of soil and nature-based solutions of what it is, living labs facilitation, so small case scenarios in which we can really go into more the practice. 
uh, digital tools for monitoring the, the, the health of the soil because it takes a lot of time to really see the, the, the evolution uh, in regenerating the soil the land and improving the decision making because at the end of the day it's all about influencing those businesses and the way they they manage their models and the policy and the idea is to create a final project that can be implemented so we want to use educational tools at the end of the day we feel with communication that the more biodirectional we can get the better because it's more experiential experiential let's say no not just a passive communication so we are working on the design on the architecture on the goals of this um, um, academy, which we we will share more details. And yeah, we hope that these communication efforts uh, allow us to you know, foster sustainable cultures and create more jobs in this regard. And finally, I just want to share another example of the communication tools that we are using in this project, and it's a set of visioning cards. Um, as you can see throughout the, the project, we put a lot of uh, focus on the visual identity, on the, the faces, no? so people can connect with those working on the field, with the landscapes that we are talking about, with the actual idea of the different soils. So it's very important that we materialize. As we visualize this no? and these cards allow us to use a more storytelling approach and to play uh, collectively so the first version of these cards is intended intended to be used as a graphic facilitation tool to guide group discussions and allow debate uh, for soil health challenges from farmers or existing soil advisors no? to really get an understanding as well from the other side and also to work closer on the solutions that i presented earlier now with all this mapping that we are doing and in future expansions of the visioning cards, uh, we expect to link it to the Soil Academy so we can offer a more accurate insight you know, for professional soil advice at several scales. So we really take communication seriously because we feel that when you create that sort of connection with people that not necessarily work on the field, you can really move the you know the actions forward no so to protect and, and to restore the the land and this is where we are today uh, there's many other examples from the work that we do at revolve but i think soil it's at the the core no from everything else thank you thank you thank you so much patricia i think that's a, such a complete project still like four years ago so plenty of space to even make it more complete and and as you were saying a great example of how to bridge the gap between the scientific knowledge and the general knowledge and make communication more co-creative, co not just unidirectional, right? And how can we like use this divulgation part and put it at the center as well as a way to engage communities to the projects and promote this collaboration that in this project is even literally with nature itself, like concretely with, with the soil. So yeah, thank you for, for sharing that and, and great to see how communication is also used to, to kind of like build all this collaboration among actors. Um, so uh, moving on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Rachel Clark, who is currently the course leader at the BA Design for Climate Justice at UAL. It's a new BA. Uh, she is design researcher and practitioner working on issues of climate change, sustainability and social inequality. She has also exhibited work internationally, co-authored research papers, and is currently co-editing a new book uh, called Designing More Than Human Smart Cities. Uh, she is also an advisor for DEFRA Futures Group in the UK. Uh, Rachel today will be sharing a research education project with undergraduate students and bringing some of her reflections. And I think you will be sharing your own slides, right? Yeah, so I'll hopefully, um, I just apologize if Teams being a bit buggy. Um, <laughs> I've updated my software and it it's, keeps freaking out. So, but we will um, see where we get to. So. Um, and it's fantastic to hear about a soil project because I will be talking about soil at the end of this. So, um, so yeah, so thanks for inviting me today. Um, and just to, um, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about it. I guess it's a, it started off a, as a conference response um, that ended up in an education project that's um, cut across different institutions. Um, and it was uh, predominantly in response to, um, in 2018, uh, a group of myself and colleagues were um, hosting a conference um, workshop around how you design uh, in response to, e uh, to prevent ecocidal eco cities. Um, and because the, the narratives that were coming through were quite depressing, 
um, and often focused on issues about how do we solve nature, you know, how do we solve these um, issues around climate change in urban areas? Um, how do we make cities more livable? Um, but it became, uh, we were concerned that these, the, the, these narratives and these very academic narratives as well um, weren't generative. Um, so what my response was to create a walk and, and, and uh, set up uh, an organization called the Ministry of Multi-Species uh, Communication. So that was in 2018. Um, and so that started as a, as a response to um, initially a, a group of academics and, and students um, within in, in um, Belgium, in Hassel, and thinking about how we engage people in thinking about these different um, ways of being with nature in urban environments where it's often quite difficult or it can be quite small or contained. Um, and thinking about those sort of the way that um, I was at a presentation the other day and in the UK in particular, um, urban areas are becoming quite important sites for um, nature conservation because uh, our countryside is so intensively farmed that a lot of species have either um, become extinct or have moved into more urban areas. A fox is a good example. Um, so um, so I, I, as part of a, re a response to the kind of conference themes, um, I set up the, the Ministry of Multispecies Communications, which is essentially a massed walk. And this has kind of evolved into various iterations over the last um, few years and has kind of fed into new projects. Um, and, and some of the concern and response um, in, in creating the Ministry of Multispecies was about how you shift perspectives in a, in a space, in an urban space to kind of start slowing down. I think what Yaron was saying, how do you slow people down? How do you create space for them to think about others other than being themselves, but also at the same time, recognizing that you can't think um, or you can't be uh, a crow, um, but, you, but you could momentarily think like a crow or kind of spend time um, being a crow-like. Um, so part of the narrative of the Ministry of Multispecies Communications is um, we set up a scenario, it's in the future, and that scenario is that all the, um, the wild species have left the cities and they've gone into hiding and the ministry has been set up as a way of training people and bringing them back through trying to find ways of communicating better and finding out what uh, these different species might um, want in their future urban spaces. Um, so it starts off with, a, with an invitation and that invitation has been, you know, some of it has been in neighbourhoods in, in London or in Manchester, um, some of it has been in conferences, some of it has been in education settings, um, and it starts off with uh, an invitation, so on the left hand side there you can see there's um, an official letter that was sent to a community neighbourhood in London, um, where they were invited and, you know, you can see it's kind of uh, branded um, as highly classified, um, and in this, in the um, last time we did it in London, they ran sessions over a number of weeks where um, young people and uh, residents were created masks of these different species. And what tends to happen is initially, um, I, I sort of made masks so people could just grab something and, and go for a walk and then think about what it was like to be this species in, in an urban environment. Um, and then what we've since done is provide some, um, we've worked with environmental ecologists to think about some of the things that are interesting or important about these different species like foxes or, um, or blue tits or worms um, to give a bit more, um, you know, to try and help people create narratives because that's been some of the feedback is that if you're not from um, an environmental background, it's very hard to come up with uh, scenarios or ideas about what a bee needs other than what you kind of might hear on, um, you know, wildlife programs. Um, so is this a direct call for um, co-design? Well, I think it, it sort of, I think, feedback and discussion with uh, students and um, academics is that it's, it sits in this uncomfortable space, you know, you're sort of thinking with, 
you can't think for, you can't speak for uh, these species, but it does, um, evidence su suggests, and, and the sort of work that I've been doing with DEFRA suggests that it does help to shift perspectives um, within situations where decision-making around kind of large landscape projects or neighbourhood projects, um, where people are trying to work out um, what, how, how to think about, um, you know, whether it's good to have more, a green space or blue space or you know what to do with gates where where to put fences those kinds of uh, really kind of practical decision making um can help with the through these um i call them kind of speculative walking experiments and i think just to just to point out that it again this has gone through various iterations over the last few years obviously during lockdown um i was able to run uh, these sessions, but I had to do it under uh, kind of strict instructions from uh, the university um, and not put anybody at risk. So people couldn't come together, but that gave another opportunity. We ran sessions on WhatsApp um, over like several hours and did kind of um, WhatsApp walks with people, um, which again is interesting because you then get a distributed sense of um, you know how how people can use these uh, methods to kind of activate a different way of seeing um, familiar spaces. Um, but I think from some of that, um, I've just included this um, quote before I sort of talk about soil is um, because even though it kind of seems quite playful and nice, and you know I think some of this came out of my son really enjoying sort of dressing up and wearing masks. So again, there's a kind of very playful element of it. And some people don't really like that. Um, but when we ran this um, event in London, this was one of the uh, this was a conversation that I had with somebody. Um, this uh, neighbour sort of stopped me and she said, I, "I you know I didn't know who you were. I thought you were a cult." And I was worried that you were going to brainwash our children to think that all animals were cuddly and nice when they're not. And some of them are pests and we need to get rid of foxes and rats and they're dirty and frighten my birds. So I think for, for some of the people that I was working with, this was quite um, a surprise that there are these, we've kind of started to talk about it with the research team that I work with. There's this hierarchy of, you know, some Often some species are considered worth saving and some worth some species are, are considered pests. And, you know, so how do you kind of move beyond those very kind of cultural um, specifications of what, you know, foxes, crows are similar. You know, people often don't like um, particular species and that kind of comes from a cultural, cultural background. Um, and just to, I'll just finish off, um, in terms of thinking about so those so the the ministry of multi-species we do bring in often bring in worms and insects and microbes more recently um but this is just to kind of point out another project where i've been trying to uh, a research project working with soil scientists and it's great to hear about patricia's uh, work which is obviously you know huge scale this um was a project to work with uh, urban gardeners and in their kind of allotments and gardens and, and to look at ways in which soil and um, different plants could change so I, I put a timer on so I wouldn't talk too much um, so different different plants can change the composition um, and we created these uh, uh, ways in which gardeners could um, document uh, through an app their weekly, uh, sorry, fortnightly interactions with the soil and, you know, and, and these kind of more sensory engagements, you know, what did the soil smell like, um, and not just kind of engage with the plants that were growing. Um, and I think, you know, as, as Patricia um, points out, I think engaging with soil is a slightly different um, mindset. And I just wanted to finish off with, you um, this quote and in terms of um, often when we're thinking about climate change and, and there's this need to act now and this, um, you know, uh, this uh, researcher Maria Puig de la Bella Casa talks about this accelerated timeline. So, you know, and yet when we're thinking about regeneration of soil, it often takes years and years and years of care um, around, you know, and what we put back in, what we take out. And, so I won't read all of this quote, I'll let you um, read it in your own time. But I think 
sometimes when we're working towards these uh, climate urgent uh, situations, there is this, um, I, I keep hearing that they, this cognitive dissonance between, you know, how much we spend slowing down and how much we're then, um, you know, thinking about this accelerated linear rhythm of intervention that could often mean that we intervene in a way that we don't really understand the, the kind of future response. And I think, you know, soil is one of those um, things, it's the stuff of, of, of life that we, um, often when we're talking about the more than human, we don't always think about these, uh, you know, these spaces that, that, are, that are microscopic. Um, and I think like Digby's work uh, speaks to that. Um, and so we've been trying to find ways of doing research that builds that, you know, the kind of microscopic world into something that we can engage with um, for future research. So I will stop there. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I, it's great to hear how all your projects have synergies, you know, like how you reference what, what Patricia was presenting and as well what Dibig was presenting about microbe and how we, throughout these engagements that I found really interesting that you were using storytelling and artifacts to actually engage the community, you actually get to get deeper insights um, from, from the people and different perspectives. And for example, depending on the species, right, and how people might prioritize or like see biodiversity a concrete way, maybe not considering all the species that confront and conform biodiversity. So I found it very interesting how you get to present all those different um, engagement um, tools to, to get people to actually talk to you and, and talk about this, these projects and topics in a more accessible way. Um, so thank you uh, for the presentation so far. And now we will actually be uh, moving on to the last section before the Q&A. Um, and we will kick off this last section about design for circularity with Jonah Bellitz, uh, who is sustainable strategy consultant at Accenture. Jonah has more than five years of experience as a sustainable consultant and has supported several clients in um, adopting and scaling circular business models. Jonah is advocating for sufficiency to be placed at the center of our collective ambitions to bring economies back to balance, in balance with nature. And he has prepared some slides uh, to talk about this and he will be sharing himself, I think. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, very much. And thanks a lot for uh for having me. I really enjoyed also listening to um, kind of the initiatives that are going on um, really on the ground, really like very localized kind of perspective on 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 nature and how it manifests in, in, in certain places and environments. Um, the perspective I'll bring here probably is a bit on, on a slightly different level and I'm really taking a private sector point of view here uh, to some extent. Um, so probably a bit of a, a bit of a break from from the level we we, we heard so far. In, in, in a nutshell, I have, uh, I would say, three messages, and I'll probably have much more content than I have time to present, but what's important for me is that I'll put out the, the pieces of information that are important for the audience to perhaps remember. Something stands out, and, and you'll come back to this and say, hey, this was actually um, of, of, of use and of interest. Um, and I'll talk firstly about the perspective of um, science-based targets for companies and cities. Um, I won't go deep into this, but when we talk about bringing economies or bringing the private sector back in tune with nature, I think it's fundamental to recognize from a planetary scale, right, what are we talking about? What are we doing? One of the best frameworks to think about this, in, in my view, um, is the planetary boundary framework, or as has been published a few weeks ago, um, the Earth system, uh, safe and just Earth system boundary uh, view. right? Um, I won't go into detail of this, but essentially what the framework captures, this builds on decades of cross-disciplinary research at the intersection of many different um, comments or systems that, that most of us um, are you know, experiencing every day and some of the speakers before me are, are encountering and really working with on the ground. What you can see in the middle here as an example is the climate system, right? Um, we understand that there are certain nutrient cycles in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen, we understand there's water cycles. All of these um, systems have, and as I described in my introduction, certain limits and, and to what we consider a stable earth system uh, that has been in place for the last 10,000 years or so. 
And it's of utmost importance that we collectively, whatever we do, really on the ground with a specific solution, or at a company level, at a city level, and all the way up to the global economy level, think about these boundaries in our work, right? Because they are, I would say, one of the best guidance framers out there to understand what are the quantifiable, with a certain degree of uncertainty, of course, uh, quantifiable limits to our collective actions, right? And this can be quite high level, it can be quite abstract. Um, what is encouraging is to see then that there is ongoing work to break down these uh, um, boundaries into city and also government, uh, city and government also, but uh, company level. We know this already from the science-based uh, uh, targets initiative on the climate dimension. There's a lot of talk right now in the private sector and among companies on greenhouse gas emissions, carbon, right? Carbon, 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 carbon dioxide. Um, some people talk of the carbon tunnel vision. You might have encountered that concept that we're hyper-focused on one of these boundaries, right? Um, so what's exciting here is now that we are now based on the work of the science-based targets network. If you're interested, go check them out. It's, it's a fantastic organization. Um, are now introducing, not us, but this organization is introducing science-based targets for nature so that we take into account fresh water use, right? Really localized impacts on the ground, right? We're talking about land use, uh, we're talking in terms of biodiversity impacts of local ecosystem species and so on. Um, so this is in development as we speak, and this will be applicable. It's freely available. There's guidance documents out there already. And if you're interested in understanding how companies uh, and also investors increasingly will take into account nature, it's really through that lens of um, the science-based view, which I think is encouraging. Um, the task force uh, on nature-related financial disclosure, this is really more from an investor point of view. Um, has also guidance documents, which you see on the right here, it's called the LEAP framework. So if you encounter that, the LEAP framework, it's all about locating as an entity, your interface with nature, right? If you think of a company, especially multinational organizations spanning very complex, very deep and broad, uh, far reaching supply chains, right? Upstream in terms of agricultural commodities, for example, which are then consolidated, shipped, prepared and then pushed to consumers. So how to locate your interfaces with nature. Um, and based on that, you can, there's many different tools and databases out there. Um, evaluate that, right? Evaluate your dependencies and your impact as an organization on, on nature. Um, so this is called dependency and impact analysis. And once you have that in place, you understand, okay, so what is my impact? What's my relation as an entity, as an organization, um, or as, well as a city at some point with nature? And based on that, you can assess and also prepare uh, to, to reverse that trend, right? To actually turn from uh, a net, um, I would say, destroyer or overburden of, of natural environments to somebody that contributes with a lot of the solutions that we've seen in this course, nature-based solutions really on the ground, knowledge and wisdom and community-based approaches to, to fixing that, right? So these two um, elements is just what I thought was important for you to kind of take away in terms of what's really going on and how this business um, will continue to start looking at, at nature. So that is my first key message. There is work ongoing. We come from a global to the now city and government, uh, city and business level based on science targets, science-based targets. I also work in circular economy and that's been what I've been focusing on mostly. And in circular economy, there is progress on the way. There's a lot of regulation in different governments. The EU in particular um, is putting a lot of sector specific guidance out there um, just recently on terms of extended producer responsibility for textiles. So you have to actually have to take care of what happens with a piece of textile in the end. Um, but I'd like to take a step back and think about, so what does that actually mean? Like what's actually the potential of the circular economy? Um, and here I'd like to make a point that is I think increasingly being picked up, but I think I'd just like to uh, reinvigorate that message, which is we need to put sufficiency at the core of this transformation, not just of um, the circular economy and how we scale up different ways of catering to demand, um, but across any kind of economic transformation that we're looking at. And so I think there's a few points of clarification needed to support that statement, right? The first one is, yes, and you probably have seen that before, if we wanna work more in tune with nature, right? We need to follow more kind of the idea that we maintain kind of resources and materials uh, for as long as possible, the highest value as possible, right? And so this is the famous um, butterfly diagram here based on the original founders of from Baumgart and McDonough, uh, the cradle to cradle concept, right? I won't go in too much into that, but I'll pick up the technical screen, the right side here later on. 
So far, so good. I think this is very intuitive. A lot of people would agree with this, like, right, this is the way to go. Yes, we need to circle, we need to maintain things, and we need to stop, um, stop uh, throwing things away. What I'd like to do is just take a step back and say, well, what we're considering interventions of the circular economy or circular strategies and so on, typically holds constant a certain forecast of demand, right, of, of what people want. And typically, the way that the economy globally and most economies are designed is towards ever increasing levels of consumption, consumption in terms of economic goods and services. And this is kind of working against what we're actually trying to achieve, right? We have an increase, a forecast of increase um, of the global economy, of the size of um, transactions or, and consumption of goods and services on the one hand. And then we have circular economy practitioners and companies and so on trying to trying to make that work, right? It's trying to, in a way, decouple that growth with the environmental impact that comes from the resource and energy use in between, right? We're transforming energy and resources into products and services, which are then consumed. There's a lot of research and literature out there that indicates that the circular economy, especially in this narrow sense of the end of life treatment of things, is not enough. Right? It's not enough to work against this massive force of the aggregate growth of the global economy. Right? There's more and more voices and empirical research um, to suggest that we need to have uh, a more, a more like a broader view, essentially, of what the circular economy is. And that brings us to the concept of sufficiency. Sufficiency is something that historically hasn't received a lot of attention um, because it is not, or because not, but certainly there's one element of saying it's not a technology driven solution. It's not something that we need to invent and scale up, but it's rather something that has to do with how we as individuals and as societies relate to consumption, right? Like why do we want things? Like what is really the desire? What's the difference between a need and a want? What is the purpose of new gadgets and devices and and you know means of traveling and so on like why are we pursuing these things and how, how do we need to perhaps change these kind of attitudes as well so that is what sufficiency is all about right just to quote here from the ipcc report on climate change mitigation it's a set of policy measures and daily practices that avoid the demand for energy materials land water and other natural resources while providing well-being for all within the planetary boundaries right so a few concepts here, but think avoid demand while providing well-being. That is the idea. And that is the actual decoupling we need to do. We need to decouple our well-being and prosperity as individuals, as societies, from an ever-increasing need to consume more things. That's kind of the idea here. And that applies also to the circular economy concept then, right? I mean, and we need to really focus on um, the strategies at the top in terms of refuse, right? How do we encourage people not to overconsume, right? How do we reduce consumption in the first place? How do we eliminate? And that's where we have certain circle strategies that you might be aware of already come in, you know, lifetime extension, uh, plant obsolescence, we need to get rid of that. We need to really make sure that what's in place we use as long as possible. And sometimes I say it's a bit like living our grandparents again, right? Just, just taking care of things, valuing things, and uh, a sense of frugality in our lives. Um, and so that's kind of the second point I want to make, right? Science-based targets, sufficiency at the core of the circular economy. And I'll keep the last one short because I know we're running out of time. Um, but the last one here is on um, circular electronic systems, right? Just a view here in terms of what we've done as Accenture. Um, we put out a research there with um, um, the Circular Electronics Partnership, which is representing roughly 40 big electronics companies, uh, the roughly 40 biggest in the world. And we put out this report, a circular electronics system map, right? And I like this because it places the focus not on the individual product. I have a circular smartphone, whatever. No, you need to have a circular system in place to really call that um, circular and lift the promise of circularity, right? And so from a system design point of view, service design point of view, it's all about that, right? So we can design circular products. We know what kind of requires uh, is required. We need circular inputs. We need to design for that. We need to um, have sales channels aligned and so on. But most importantly, we need to have the system and the enablers around that. Right? So as you embark now on a journey of system and service design and so on, keep in mind the ecosystem or the enablers of the broader system you're envisioning and that you're working towards. There's different isolated solutions, but how do they relate to each other? And what are the fundamental enablers to really scale this up? And oftentimes, you hear this a lot, it's all about collaboration from end to end, right? Across the value chain, in terms of the design, the materials that are used, consumer incentivization and so on. So that's a quick, really quick run through. I'd just like to thank and close with the words of um, science-based targets on the way. Uh, we need sufficiency at the core of the circular economy. And as we design 
products or towards circularity, we need to keep the system and cross-sector collaboration in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. That was such a, an interesting presentation. And as I love the concept of uh, sufficiency, right? It's not only about making our current practices more environmentally friendly, but also about transforming the whole system that is of these practices that are so depending on different resources, right? And actually here as designers, we have a lot of opportunity to implement projects to support customers as well. So yeah, it's it's a threat, but as well an opportunity for us to do the projects to support mm. that. And we're Maybe running only one point, the customers, but also citizens. I think sometimes yeah. we, for us, it's the same, but to really take a step back and become owners of the design of the economy, we need to abstract and say, we are citizens, we're designing the economy, we're designing our role as a consumer. So I think sometimes it's important to take a step back and say, what's the difference between a person and, and, and like a human and really a consumer? And what is the difference? Sorry, just to add. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much. We're running a little bit late, so I'm gonna introduce uh, Roberto, our last speaker today. Um, and Roberto is IBM and VZ ESG Growth Lead, uh, which this stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. I hope I got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. Roberto has been working in IBM for seven years, supporting clients in the area, areas of AI, business development, transparency and ESG reporting. As part of his business development remit, uh, Roberto has worked on a number of technology focused pilots. And he's also a member of the Beef FTT UAL Steering Committee as a sustainable startup advisor and a Football U7 team member, manager. Sorry, uh, Roberto, the floor is yours. Wow, thank you very much, Ada, and uh, and thank you very much for your, for your time and and listening uh, to to me for the next uh, five minutes plus. Um, I guess uh, in in a nutshell, what I do in in my all, in my my day to day job is going to be the, the sort of topic for the next five minutes. Um, I help client uh, measure their footprint, their impact on the environment so that they can improve, so that they can reduce their impact on that environment. So that's uh, the kind of uh, part that I wanted to, 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 to talk about in terms of, uh, you know, the how, how do we develop environmental sustainability from that point of view how do we measure so it's all about the measurement thinking about what noah said earlier on right one keyword one way to one one big take out the measurement now um, i'm going to show you a couple of slides just uh, to guide you through some content uh, and uh, hopefully yeah there we go so in fact, where I'll start, I'll start from something that should be very familiar to you now. Uh, in fact, it was introduced as a concept by Noah at the very beginning of uh, the panel, uh, the very definition of environmental sustainability. Uh, and that's, that's that sort of uh, uh, sufficiency concept, right? Um, the, the, there are limits in everything that we produce and we shouldn't use nature more than we are allowed to. Uh, we should... Uh, um, that, that's the idea that goods and services should be produced in a way that don't deplete resources in a way that those resources can be replaced. And that means uh, in, practice, in practice that uh, um, environmental and economical objective should go uh, hand in hand all the time. So we're not there yet, but we need to be if we want to meet all uh, uh, the net zero targets that all the countries, all the companies uh, are uh, stating. Now, um, in, in, what does it mean in, in terms of measurement? Well, the financial growth, so to speak, uh, financial progress is very easy to measure. Uh, think about GDP, think about uh, profit, think about cost in a sense. Um, environmental impact is a lot more difficult to measure. But that's what organizations are being asked to do now. Uh, now, um, if we think about what's happening now is not going to be a secret that most organizations are nowadays making uh, measurable commitments on what they're going to do, when they're going to do by uh, that by, and how they're going to reduce that impact, how they're going to uh, decarbonize. But it's also not a secret in the industry, uh, across industry in fact, uh, that those uh, same organizations uh, struggle to put it into practice struggle to execute and struggle to measure um, uh, that, that sort of impact. And as there is an old saying that says, uh, what doesn't uh, get measured doesn't get done. So this is just a selection of uh, some uh, of the sustainability 
um, sustainability commitments of um, large and smaller organizations. They all talk about um, what they're going to do in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years, starting from Patagonia, a, you know, a great business, uh, B Corp, always in the news for the right reasons, uh, going down to uh, Boho, probably in the news for the wrong reasons, but recently done uh, lots to please investors, to add transparency to what they do and so on and so forth. And obviously IBM, I put it there because uh, uh, it would be only fair to compare ourselves to, to other uh, organizations uh, so that you don't think we shy away from it. Um, uh, IBM has, um, uh, has a long list of uh, environmental and social achievements starting from uh, 1971 and up to now. So, all those organizations uh, are trying to achieve the North Star, which is uh, meet the uh, the goals that um, um, investors, um, regular re uh, so, sort of governments, um, consumers and uh, employees are asking them to uh, to achieve and that transparency. And that's uh, and that's the, really the financial incentive that is behind this uh, movement. Um, now, meeting those ambition, ambitious goals uh, is uh, difficult, as we said earlier on, but the financial incentives are there. Uh, investors are um, ready to rate organizations higher or lower in terms of credit, credit worthy, um, uh, depending on their ESG rating. So if the ESG ratings are high, they will, give they will give those companies better rates. Um, similarly, uh, co consumers are prepared to shop more sustainably and uh, employees are attracted by companies that uh, walk the talk and governments uh, surely have put so lots of regulatory um, sort of frameworks to comply to. Uh, alternatively, I I failing that, there are consequences that can go from rep can range from reputation dam reputational damage to um, to fines. So, looking quick, checking quickly the time. So, I, I think uh, one uh, the, the financial incentive is also very well researched now, in the sense that organisations are very well aware, at least those. Uh, uh, that I started on the journey to sustainability and to, not, to, not, to net zero, which are the majority now, uh, they're very well aware that uh, that sort of journey uh, and that sort of maturity in terms of ESG capabilities will give them the upper end in the market, both from the point of view of growth of revenue as well as profitability. But obviously the big conundrum here is uh, the data because if you don't measure what you are doing, what you are, the, your progress on a regular basis, on, your, on all your buildings, on uh, everything that you've got under control, your operations and everything that is not under your control, so your supply chain, that's, uh, that's going to reflect badly on uh, your ratings, or reflect ba badly on your consumer attraction and so on and so forth. So that's uh, what I wanted to show you. Um, I will leave um, the two, three minutes uh, that we have left on the clock for question and answer or for closing. I thank you very much for the time today and um, have a good lunch for those who haven't had the pleasure to eat it yet. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, really interesting as well to hear about how to monitor, right? Right. Many times we put a lot of focus on designing and like putting the projects in place, but not actually on tools, how to measure everything that we're doing. So I think that's great work that you guys are doing as well in that area. So I will, uh, we're running a bit out of time, but wanted to maybe pick a couple of questions before leaving. Uh, so I will leave now, uh, I will leave now um, Ipec, uh, who has been gathering questions and will be asking, um, throwing a, a, little, a, a couple of questions to you guys. Thank you, Ada. That was amazing. Thanks for all of the insights. Uh, as Ada said, we're running a bit over time, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of questions. And I'm kindly asking if you're comfortable with sharing your email. Maybe the, our audience can reach out to you and ask their questions afterwards because we're running a bit late. Uh, so I have 
three questions in the messages and one two questions in the q a i'll start from the q a alex is asking how do you understand the difference between the natural and the artificial and the maybe we can get answers to that first and his second question is when thinking about co-design with nature how do we avoid the trap of speaking on behalf of the actors and who can't communicate in the same way that we do just furthering our confirmation bias it's a very good question. I kind of have the same question. Um, who would like to answer? Okay, I can start with like the the biases. I think we can't. <laughs> the bias is there because we are humans. We're kind of translating that. Um, I think the best we what we can do is kind of when we create in my case like these perso non-human personas or more than human personas is really do your scientific research so it's not just only imagination but do your scientific research kind of what are what's the real data saying about the biology the geology of, of, of the things you're you're researching the soil for example is, being, is, is mentioned um and maybe kind of make an ethical framework how to use these uh, personas so if you include this voice what kind of like what what should you do and what you should what do what you shouldn't do so that's one thing and maybe it's also important for us as designers to include specialists uh, you know so like i am not a specialist in 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 forestry but i can i have some friends here in the neighborhood that are um, biologists that work here and they can help me understand these things better i think that's kind of the way to go and it's, I think it's our role for as designers to kind of use our imagination and our creativity to kind of bridge that gap between nature and this human world. That's kind of, I think, well, that's what I see happening. Thank you, Jeroen. Um, also, when we are on you, could you share the link of the panel that you mentioned before if you're available for everyone to sign up for next week? Um, and the next question is for Jona. Um, from Yona had to drop out, uh, oh. drop out. yeah because thank we're you. running a little bit over time so <laughs> thank you next question is from Damien then uh, he's curious in each speaker's experience and what has been one of the most difficult sticky challenges when attempting to cultivate different mindsets towards nature among stakeholders, especially since we all still live within systems that incentivize um, us towards undesirable behaviors like overconsumption, consumption, and etc. Um, I can ask, answer from my perspective. Um, yeah, definitely this is one of the challenges that we have. One, segmenting the audiences that we want to talk to, which is already like understanding who am I going to talk to. And we tend to select the ones that are already sort of informed or convinced about a given topic. But the biggest challenge is to empathize with others that don't have that reality. So understanding different contexts is something that uh, it's still a challenge, no? Because you need to do a lot of kind of field work in citizen science, let's say, no? Like surveying, talking to people, and really having these discussions to understand how others are living that reality. Um, so I think this is the the work that we are trying to to do the most, no? Like really finding these user journeys, let's say, from uh, not being aware to something to being engaged with a given topic that we want to engage them to change behaviors, and really. Um, going like the other way around, not through first un understanding their realities and, and empathizing with, with that. So, yeah, it's a work in progress. Yes, here. Oh, you're muted, Jeroen. Jeroen, you're, you're muted. We cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I think Ipek asked me to share the link to the webinar, but my uh, chat doesn't work. So okay. maybe cool. I can send an email to Ada and then she shares it in the chat. Perfect. That would. 
um, so we, yeah. yes, we need to wrap up. At a, you know, it's really interesting and now more questions are popping up, but unfortunately we're already over time and we need to uh, wrap up. Uh, but we would like to thank our panelists today for taking the time to join us and prepare this session. We've uh, given us lots, you've given us lots of um, to think about in terms of how we build empathy with nature, methodologies that we use to do so, and also how we can bring uh, in collaboration in different ways. And beyond that, your unique perspective on this topic. So thank you so much. We'd also like to thank the audience for their engagement. And finally, we'd like to thank UAL for bringing in the platform to make all this possible. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Ciao. <clears throat>